All right, welcome to the week 15 forum. Uh, this week we are covering chapter 13, and there's a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump into it. Uh, I'll note that I'm uh, recording this post-coronavirus, but I uh, just want to lay out this chapter in broad outlines, and we can always look at the COVID uh, crisis as a current events uh, issue to discuss the course, uh, you know, discuss it over the course of the week, and, and really for the remainder of the semester and probably for years to come. Uh, let's begin with fiscal policy. Uh, the federal government has a mandate to tax and spend to promote the general welfare. Uh, what constitutes the general welfare, however, is deeply controversial. I will mention a particular federal subsidy. Pell Grants. Uh, how many of you are eligible for Pell Grants? You don't have to answer that. What exactly is a Pell Grant? Uh, Pell Grants were named after a Democratic senator from Florida named Claiborne Pell, uh, who added a provision to the Higher Education Act of 1965 that provides federal funds to students who can demonstrate need. These are grants, in other words, they don't have to be repaid. So why does the federal government subsidize access to college for low-income students? Uh, the answer is that social science research demonstrates that a college education is one of the surest pathways into the middle class. And those studies have been replicated over and over again. So once again, this is an area in which there is considerable disagreement. Uh, Democrats want to expand the subsidies. They want to you know, increase uh, Pell Grants, uh, the, you know, both the numbers of Pell Grants that are granted and the, the amounts that are given to people. And, and Republicans generally think that paying for college is a matter of personal responsibility. Uh, I'll leave it to you to weigh in, you know, which side you support and whether it, it's good policy uh, to expand the number of college educated people in the country. Uh, chapter 13 also addresses economic policy, which concerns the efforts by the government to ensure that the monetary supply uh, and the overall value of the currency remains stable. Uh, now, economics is a very complicated discipline that, that generates a lot of counterintuitive insights into how people behave in the pursuit of money and other valuable goods. So things can get complicated. I'm gonna try and give you a broad idea about the government's role in the economy, and it does have a role. Uh, economic policy is an important dimension of public policy. Uh, because a government's failure to ensure consistency in the value of money can introduce instability into the economy that can impede investment and create enormous incentives for corruption and actually produce a lot of economic disruptions. Think Greece, for example, uh, because a lot of uh, economic behavior runs contrary to what common sense might otherwise dictate. It's really important for the government to get economic policy right. So what can the government do to ensure the value of a dollar that it doesn't depreciate too much? In other words, lose value. This is the realm of monetary policy. So what is the chief institution responsible for implementing uh, monetary policy? That would be the Federal Reserve Board, which is a mix of public and private banking institutions that act as the central, you know, the central banking uh, uh, whatever you call it, of the federal government, the central banker for the federal government. Uh, what is a central bank? It's basically a reserve institution that controls the availability of money. So how does the Fed do that? Uh, to use a metaphor, uh, the Fed controls the spigot, uh, and, the federal, and the Fed governors do that by raising and lowering interest rates that the reserves regional banks extend to other banks. So when interest rates are high, there's a significantly diminished incentives for bankers to extend loans. Who wants to buy a car when the interest rates are at 18%? So when interest rates are low, then there's significantly greater incentive for bankers to extend credit. So the Fed's in a, uh, in a position to anticipate economic performance and to ensure that the economy maintains steady growth. Uh, the point of monetary policy is to avoid extreme. If the economy is growing too fast and there's a risk of inflation, which can lead to a recession uh, as the prices of goods rise rapidly and the supply of, of the goods declines. So what is a recession? That's one of the things that we, you know, we, we worry about, right? This is an instance when the economy is actually shrinking and it's shrinking because prices have risen so fast that the people, you know, people can't afford to buy goods. Um, that kind of economic trend can feed on itself and create serious unemployment and long-term disruptions as people are laid off because of uh, lower demand, which can further create what we call a depression, which is a prolonged period of recession. Okay, 
uh, because the unemployed generally can't spend as much as they would if they had a job, again, because of uncertainty, right? Uh, the Fed tries to ensure an evenly functioning economy, uh, evenly functioning economy by tracking economic growth and raising interest rates when it appears that the economy is running too hot or growing too fast and lowering interest rates when the economy actually does go into recession. So that's the, you know, sort of the 10 cent lecture on monetary policy. Let me offer you a, a history lesson to illustrate uh, how complicated this can be. In the 1970s, the U.S. economy entered a phase that no country had really experienced. The economy was shrinking, but prices remained really high, uh, and there was persistently high unemployment. Uh, economists actually created a new uh, concept to describe the situation. They called it stagflation. So what caused it? Why was it such a persistent problem? And what policies could the Federal Reserve undertake to combat stagflation? Uh, and we can talk about that in the thing. Uh, another, another issue that Chapter 13 addresses is welfare. Uh, for you students, what do you think of when you hear the word welfare? Uh, what do you think it means? Why, you know, why is the federal government and through federal subsidies and states involved with combating poverty? Uh, the case for using the government to, you know, as a means of reducing the worst consequences of poverty are that many people who find themselves poor didn't earn it, right? They didn't fritter away their wealth or deliberately decline to work uh, and earn a living. Rather, they were born into poverty or lost work doing, due to the malfunction of the economy or simply live in an area where economic opportunity isn't, you know, isn't provided. Uh, welfare has its origins in the workings of the modern industrial economy. Uh, previously, work was predominantly agricultural in nature, and communities and families were generally in a position to deal with the consequences of a, of a bad growing season. Uh, industrialization changes the relationship between individuals and their economy. Uh, the scale of industrialization means that there's more money, uh, but that it's not equitably distributed, and that creates the, the volatility that can lead to recessions and, again, even depressions. Uh, welfare has a political dimension to it as well. Uh, the modern origin of welfare can be traced to, to Germany, uh, where the newly established German state in the 1870s confronted a well-organized labor movement that was right on the cusp of becoming radicalized and prone to revolutionary passions. Uh, Otto von Bismarck, the first German chancellor, responded to that potential threat uh, by basically offering German workers welfare providing them with better pay, more reasonable hours, access to health care, and those sorts of things basically weaned much of the German working class away from socialists like Karl Marx preaching revolution and effectively bought, you know, bought them into, got them skin in the game uh, in, the, you know, in the new modern German state. And, and they had reason to believe that the German state was not unalterably opposed to workers enjoying a decent living. The same thing happened shortly thereafter in England. Uh, but it didn't happen in the United States until well into the 20th century. So what are the primary programs of the American welfare state? There, there are really three of them, right? Uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, Social Security is, uh, you know, originated as what we call a social insurance program whose intent is to reduce poverty among the elderly. It's, it's essentially an intergenerational system of enforced savings. If you consistently work over the course of your adult life, you'll be paying into the Social Security Trust Fund. When you hit a designated age, I believe these days it's 67, if you were born after 1960, uh, you apply to receive your benefits and you get monthly payments for which you pay annual income taxes. It's a very elegant program. Uh, money comes into the trust fund and money is sent out monthly. Um, there are some economists who periodically calculate something that is called the cost of living adjustment or COLA adjustment, uh, which provides retirees with slightly higher benefits, right? Over time, they, you know, they get more money. Uh, people who earn a modest income over their working lives benefit considerably more from Social Security than do wealthier Americans. So hands up, how many of you think Social Security won't be around for you when, you know, to benefit from? The reality is that Social Security is a very, very sound, very well-financed program, and that the only reason that it wouldn't be around uh, for you to rely on when you retire is if somebody kills it. 
Uh, in my opinion, Social Security is solvent and could be funded for another 300 years with some modest adjustments in how the, the program is funding, funded or you know how it dispenses benefits. If anything, current res, uh, recipients should be getting larger COLA adjustments uh, and the wealthier should be paying more in Social Security taxes. Most Americans are not aware that there's a ceiling on payroll taxes, including FICA, which is the, the dedicated fund that, that funds Social Security. Um, Americans only pay into Social Security on the first $113,000 of their income or so. And only around 19% of Americans earn more than $100,000 annually. But some Americans make that in a month. Think of it this way. The head coaches for Oklahoma and OSU do not pay Social Security taxes after January. They, they both earn you know, millions of dollars annually. I'll pause to let that sink in a little bit. One of the most controversial aspects of the American welfare state, of course, is health care, where that includes access to affordable insurance. Medicare is one of the first major programs designed to ensure that elderly Americans have sustained access to health care. Uh, Medicare is the most socialized aspect of American public policy. If you're a certain age, 65, you are eligible to use the Medicare program to help defray the costs of health care which is always higher for the elderly. Like Social Security, most Americans pay into the Medicare system over the course of their working lives. But Medicare's dedicated taxes are much lower than Social Security, and as a consequence, the program is much more vulnerable, and much less solvent. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, passed in 2010, uh, was supposed to expand access to health insurance and improve the overall quality of people's access to uh, health care. The four principal elements of the ACA were the mandate, which basically meant that you had to purchase some kind of an insurance or pay what amounted to a tax, two healthcare exchanges, which were online marketplaces where individuals could purchase uh, private insurance, risk corridors, which were essentially subsidies to insurance companies designed to incentivize their offering insurance in unhealthy, low population states like Oklahoma, and for Medicaid expansion, which was again was designed to make the Affordable Care Act too good a deal for the states to pass on. Uh, so why is the ACA not working the way le legislators uh, intended? I I'll prompt the discussion with a couple of observations. First, re Republicans rejected it entirely. Uh, not one Republican at the federal level voted for it. They campaigned against it in 2010, in 2012, in 2014, and in 2016, promising their voters all along that they were going to repeal and replace it with something better. Uh, what that better plan would look like, they never did say, and they still haven't. Uh, second, uh, Republicans sabotaged the ACA at both the federal and state levels. Uh, at the state level, states largely controlled by Republicans like Oklahoma rejected Medicaid expansion, which hurt low-income people in those states. At the federal level, Republicans eventually were effective at killing the risk corridors, which caused insurance companies to hike their premiums in those low-income, uh, you know, unhealthy states like Oklahoma uh, to ensure their profitability. So, why is the ACA still around? Largely because Republicans, despite controlling both houses of Congress and the presidency for from 2016 to 2018, were unable to kill it. Uh, their plan to repeal and replace was wildly unpopular with Americans, and they were ultimately unable to get it passed. So let me be clear. Governments have always subsidized health care. Without subsidies, only a handful of the very wealthy would be able to afford the attentions of a doctor or a surgeon. And there would be far fewer doctors and surgeons because the marketplace for such skills would be extremely limited. Uh, there would be little to no health care infrastructure, few hospitals or urgent care facilities. Uh, most people would die far younger uh, than, that, than if they were routinely afforded access to health care professionals. Think about having a pandemic like we're currently going through, but with, you know, only one third of the hospitals and probably less than a third of the doctors that, that are available and nurses. So think about it. Um, in any event, I hope I've given you plenty to think about and to discuss. As always, if you don't agree with me, take me on. I'm not going to grade you down for disagreeing. Uh, likewise, if you have any questions or are confused about anything that I've said in these videos or anything in the text that you don't understand, the forum is the place to clear it up. Let's have a great week and stay safe.